thank you for inviting me to contribute to this discussion. It is an honor. I'm a solicitor from London who, on behalf of the Law Society, has been involved with Colombia for the last 10 years. Colombians have experienced 60 years of conflict between a triangle of armed actors comprising the army and the police, the guerrillas, and the paramilitaries. Paramilitary groups are widely acknowledged to be state-sponsored, according to Amnesty International, and the foremost group of human rights lawyers collective, called CAHA. The population of human rights defenders, particularly in rural areas, are caught in the crossfire. Colombia has around 5 million displaced persons, expelled from their land by paramilitaries and the state security forces. Reasons for this expropriation of land vary from changing the use to large-scale palm oil production or to make way for the extractive industries which have established large mining installations. The restitution of land is a crucial issue and since the introduction of the Victims and Land Restitution Law by the current government, it has heightened tension in rural areas. Throughout these decades of conflict, Colombia has remained ostensibly a democratic state, with elections according to the Colombian constitution, based on the separation of powers and formal guarantees of human rights. Colombia is a party to most of the major conventions on human rights and was one of the original signatories of the Universal Declaration in 1948. Colombia continues to be an extremely dangerous country to be a lawyer and to uphold access to justice. According to information from the Attorney General's Office in 2012, and Richard mentioned this statistic this morning, we were told 4,400 incidents against lawyers between 2002 and 2012, but actually, as Richard said, that's probably 5,200 incidents being investigated by the local prosecutors. And we've had, the caravanners have reports of 450 lawyers at least who have been killed in Colombia since 1991, and sadly, 15 cases, three more than Richard mentioned this morning, have been reported to the caravanna in 2013 alone. Many cases of threats and attacks are reported by the Colombian Association of Human Rights Lawyers, ACADEM. A minority of the 200,000 lawyers in Colombia are human rights lawyers, and I've met many of the barely 50 who are practicing mostly in collectives. These lawyers are part of the community of human rights defenders in Colombia. Any community leader, indigenous leader, peasant farmers, women's rights leaders, trade unionists, teachers, priests, students, or similar activists who defends human rights is at severe risk of death, threats, attacks, and assassinations. According to data published by We Are Defenders program, and you can look it up online, murders of human rights defenders increased by 27% in the first six months of 2013. That was 29 cases in 2012, 37 in 2013 in the first six months. And the impunity for these crimes stands at 97%. It is a matter of grave concern that there are high numbers of killings in one particular area, and that's the Valle de Calca, with its regional capital, Cali. The lawyers in this region have come from all walks of life, the ones who've been killed this year including criminal lawyers, defending the right to defend, and administrative lawyers. In most cases, they were shot by unknown assailants as they went about their working lives. The data on lawyers killed in this area has been collected by the Society of Litigating Lawyers, who are very active in Cali in protecting their members. They have called repeatedly upon the Colombian state to investigate the killings, and this is met with silence. Human rights lawyers live with these death threats. Most common are threats received by email or text on the lines of, you are a guerrilla, we will kill you. The Colombian state initiated a process of demobilization of the paramilitaries in 2003 to 2006. 
Paramilitaries were encouraged to enter a process of confession to their crimes in return for short sentences. For example, in the Colombian Penal Code, the sentence for murder is 40 to 60 years. Paramilitaries were offered 5 to 8 years in return for information about incidents they were involved in. The process was flawed and leaders were extradited to the USA to answer on drug um, offences, while the families of the victims got little justice. In 2008, I sat with families in a Barentonia courtroom, watching on a big screen the questioning of a paramilitary in an adjoining room. The widow of a man killed by associates of the middle ranking paramilitary being questioned was assisted to send written questions to the prosecutor by the human rights lawyer who was our host. The paramilitary simply answered nearly every question as, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Some participants in the process were not the actual paramilitary in question, accused, but were paid to stand in for them. Convictions from that process were very low, and the failure has been even more stark when it became clear that the paramilitary groups had regrouped and even retained their original names. Death threats, physical attacks and assassinations are not the only form of oppression suffered by human rights lawyers. Their offices are burgled, case documents and computers stolen, they encounter cyber sabotage and note the constant surveillance by individuals on the street. A very clear example of state harassment was the surveillance and intelligence project against human rights lawyers by a state agency in 2009. The agency was the DAS, DAS, the Departamento Administrativo de Seguridad, which had been watching the lawyers, photographing them, recording details of their lives and that of their families, even the students interned in their offices, and that information was being passed on to paramilitaries. I've clicked, oh, sorry, that was the slide that went with that bit. I got a bit behind myself. This slide and the next is a tragic roll call about the lawyers who've been killed this year and about who the Caravana, Colombia Caravana Advocacy Group has written to the Colombian president and uh, many others in um, Colombia. And we have started getting uh, replies to some of our inquiries about um, what is being done and what process has been reached. But I'll only mention one of the killings which typifies these assassinations. Um, there's, here's some more of the lawyers. But one I could tell you about is Ricardo Rodriguez Catamarca, he was a human rights lawyer and former local human rights ombudsman who was shot dead on Thursday the 10th of October 2013, in other words, just a month ago, by unknown assailants traveling on a motorcycle. He had reported serious human rights violations committed by paramilitary groups operating in the area, including displacements, forced disappearance and killings, and abuses against civilians by the Colombian army. He's also been involved in denouncing a series of mass detentions and unfounded criminal proceedings brought against the small-scale farmers. And in addition to the killings of constant threats, I've put five examples here. Yeson Pava, who I've met, I know, and the human rights defender Diego Martinez received death threats uh, by email when they were attending the Movement for the Victims of State Crimes Conference in July. During the event, they noticed plain clothes, men riding plateless motorcycles circling the venue when alerted to the matter, the police did nothing. On 15th of August, Jose Humberto Torres, who I met um, first of all in 2008 and continue to know him, of the Committee of Solidarity with Political Prisoners, received death threats by the Rastrojos military, paramilitary group, and the threat stated that he and other lawyers in the collective are military targets because they have links with the guerrilla, are hampering the peace process and the work of mining companies in Colombia. So you begin to see the kind of direction from whence come the threats. On the 1st of August, threats were made against lawyer Manuel Garzón and other human rights defenders from the Interchurch Justice and Peace Commission, an NGO, 
paramilitaries were keeping them to the NGO under surveillance. They work with communities in the Kulgaradu and Kiwam and Yo River Basin. Um, recently, a judge has sentenced two businessmen linked to the African palm industry to 125 months in prison for the forced displacement of these two communities. Plus, they were sentenced for aggravated conspiracy to commit a crime and the invasion of land of special ecological importance. They've been acting together with paramilitaries. Manuel Garçon represented the communities. Again, you can see from which direction comes the threat. On the 10th of September and the 24th of September, further death threats were sent by Los Rastrojos to human rights defenders and lawyers' organization, CACA, the Committee of Solidarity with Political Prisoners, and the Gira Castro Corporation. They were given 72 hours to leave their areas of work. And then on the 19th of October, threats were made by Los Rastrojos against members of the National Organization of Indigenous People, ONIC, including Luis Fernando Arias Arias, a lawyer and an ONIC high counselor, declaring them to be military targets. The threats were made during a National Indigenous Human Rights process called the Minga, which began five days earlier and was coordinated by the ONIC. This is part of a, a trend this year where there has been far more grassroots participation in strikes and social protests. The driving force behind the lawyers, tax on lawyers, comes from a variety of directions. There are clear circumstances where human rights lawyers are representing victims of state crimes, such as the extrajudicial killings by the Colombian army. This refers to the practice now ended when army personnel were offered incentives to kill guerrillas. Lacking actual captured or dead guerrillas, some army members resorted to kidnapping or set up false employment agencies which enticed men from cities and from rural areas. These kidnapped or duped people were later found dead dressed in guerrilla uniforms. I heard testimony about family members who were found dead in circumstances about which their families knew nothing. One mother I talked to had received an excited call from her son who said he was going to be picked up by a minibus and taken to a new job. Shortly afterwards, she heard of his death allegedly as a gorilla. Not only the lawyers for the victims, but also judges received threats during the course of some of these trials against the army personnel. Problems come straight from the top, not just the leadership of the armed forces, but even the president has condemned lawyers and judges publicly. Lawyers are distracted from their legal work by being criminalized themselves. They are accused of a rebellion and of being a member of a guerrilla organization. They cannot represent their clients once they're arrested and have to defend themselves. Um, I've just given the example of David Ravella Crespo there, who uh, sentenced to 18 years. I went in um, September to present an amicus, help to present an amicus prepared by the Bar Human Rights Committee in London um, on David's case. And um, it was a case where he had been denied due process and his human rights violated during the trial. And um, we've heard recently that uh, we failed at that appeal and that the amicus was unfortunately not successful and the case is now going to the Supreme Court. What about the role of Colombians' professional bodies? Well, Colombian lawyers belong to a large variety of professional associations such as alumni associations of their universities or organizations associated with their area of work. They have been attempts to establish an independent national bar association for some years. Such an association would provide national representation, regulation, and a measure of protection. The International Bar Association Human Rights Institute has facilitated discussion with main Colombian human rights, sorry, main Colombian lawyers groups, including human rights lawyers. And in 2012, we met with lawyers who had participated in the first national congress to establish the Bar Association, which included a session addressed by human rights lawyers. 
There are some domestic measures. Three minutes. Right, I shall let you read that rapidly and refer to the National Unit of Protection in the Vice President's Office, which unfortunately is not very effective. And um, I'll speak more about that in our last session when we talk about better protection. And uh, some uh, lawyers um, do, through the Colombian Constitutional Report, obtain orders for protection of their clients. Any Colombian citizen can um, seek a uh, tutela under the Constitution to um, get a decision on the violation of human rights. I'm just going to mention the peace process because it is a key moment, a critical junction mentioned by Kieran this morning. Talks between the government and the guerrillas and the army continue. They've been going on for one year. But, however, human rights lawyers are seeking protection and justice for the victims of the guerrillas and the army. And talks about a general amnesty against the rights of victims. Human rights lawyers are calling for a special tribunal for transitional justice in Colombia with recommendations to ensure that those who have committed crimes against humanity are prosecuted. Some of the lawyers receive protective measures ordered by the Inter-American Commission. And if I go straight on now to the Special Rapporteurs and the Universal Periodic Review. The UPR in Colombia um, session started in 2012, and it does enable complaints to be brought. The Special Rapporteurs, as you know, investigate, and their two uh, latest reports are mentioned there, 2009 and 2010, and provides recommendations that organizations such as the Colombia Caravana can monitor and follow up. The ICC, mentioned here, yes, has not yet um, brought any cases against perpetrators in Colombia, but investigations continue. Uh, international NGOs such as Peace for Gays International, who accompany the human rights defenders in Colombia, are extremely valuable. And I've mentioned their Avocats Sans Frontier and the Caravana Internacional de Juristas, which is the Colombian Caravana. Briefly, the oh, I'm not pressing the right stuff, that's right. So this is about the response of the international community. And Richard mentioned this morning that um, the caravan has been going since 2008 and over 160 lawyers have gone in these very large delegations to provide a massive spotlight and visit very many regions in Colombia. And um, we went in 2000, and I hope we fast because I'm going fast now. <laughs> um, I, we went also in 2010 and uh, on that occasion we had 57 lawyers from 15 different countries who um, visited 11 regions that year and heard testimony from lawyers and their clients. And we met local prosecutors, police, human rights ombudsmen in the regions, and government officials in Bogota. We investigated and reported and said to the government department what is being done about this. And the reports coming from all 11 regions were fairly similar, the same kind of situations being faced by human rights defenders in every region. So, the last one, just to say that we went again in 2012. You can read all about it on that website. Please do note it. You will get these in your post-conference pack. But if you want to note it now, it's a quick way of hearing much more about it. Next year, we're going on the fourth delegation, and we welcome delegates from every country. So please, if you are interested, if this is something that you feel you would like to do, please talk to me afterwards. There's two of us in the room who have been on the Colombia Caravana delegations, and we would be delighted to discuss them with you. Okay, January the 24th, mentioned by Richard and Dirace. This is the day of the endangered lawyer, and in 2014, Colombian lawyers have been chosen to be highlighted. So you could get involved and organize something here. So we were told in August 2012, international support saves lives. And this network of support makes its concerns known in every Colombian embassy where the caravana has members. We engage, as Richard said, Joe Air, remember, 
We engage with ambassadors and at all levels up to and including the President of the Republic. It's a constant reminder that human rights lawyers are not alone and every one of us can play a part in providing that support. I urge you to do so and I thank you for listening.